Welcome, everyone, to our hearing of the House Committee on Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs. It is Tuesday, March 19th at 2 p.m. here in Conference Room 325 at the State Capitol. And we're also running this hearing by video conference. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Those who are testifying, I would request you keep your testimony to two minutes. And I'll ask you to summarize at that point. Uh, if you're testifying via Zoom, please keep yourself muted and your video off until you testify. And then after your POW testifying, turn off your video and mute yourself. That would be great. Uh, if you've got any technical issues, use the Zoom chat function to communicate with our stellar staff on uh, our technical team here. And they'll help you. Uh, and just only use the chat function for technical issues only. Uh, if you're disconnected unexpectedly, don't panic. Just rejoin as soon as you can, and I'll try to fit you in when you come back. If the power goes off in the building here, or we have some other sort of emergency and we have to reschedule the hearing or schedule a meeting for decision making, I'll make sure to post appropriate notice so everyone will know. If you're testifying via Zoom, please do not use any copyrighted or trademarked images. That kicks us off of YouTube, and that's a problem, so don't do that. And if everyone would please conduct themselves with aloha, no profanity or uncivil behavior, you know the routine. It's okay to disagree, but let's not be disagreeable. So thanks very much. We're all here to do the best for the state of Hawaii. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. First up, we have Senate Bill. Uh, oh, yes, sorry. I'm going to need to move three of the bills that are later in the agenda up to the top of the agenda uh, out of deference for people who need to catch an airplane and go off. Uh, so we're going to be moving. Uh, there's two bills at the very end of the agenda uh, related to transportation and related to highway safety. We're going to move them up to the first two on the agenda. And then we're also going to move up the bill relating to Kalopapa up to the number three on the agenda. Uh, so that we can accommodate testifiers. If uh, any, if there's testifiers on these three bills that aren't here at the beginning because they were expecting it to be later, uh, I reserve the right to have them come up later on in the hearing and testify at that point. Okay, thank you all for your understanding. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, our first up is Senate Bill 3242, SD1, HD1, relating to transportation. This measure requires the Department of Transportation or County Transportation Agency having jurisdiction over roads, highways, or similar infrastructure to evaluate high risk or dangerous corridors or intersections and plan strategies for mitigation. The measure provides that an engineering study is not required to be considered if the Department of Transportation or any county decreases maximum speed limits within one mile of a school. So first up, we have Director Ed Sniffen, Department of Transportation. Welcome, sir. Please proceed. Thank you. Hello, Chair, Vice Chair, members. Ed Sniffen with Hawaii DOT. Uh, we stand in support. Thank you. You want to tell us why this is an important bill? We always, we want to, you, you have TV time here. Give us a little, you know, highlights of why this is important. It's a big one for us. The, the portion of the bill that allows us to reduce speeds in areas that are dangerous uh, without going through a speed study allows us to react immediately to situations that are of concern. In the past, um, those speed studies could take a month or up to three months. And that time frame, um, just, just for, um, for, uh, for context, in, in Hawaii, in general, we have 107 fatalities per year. So in general, we have about eight or nine fatalities per month. If we take three months to address the situation, there's a potential of, of having a fatality in those areas when we have concerns. So having that, that ability to move forward in reducing speed limits um, and addressing it with uh, other speed mitigation devices immediately helps tremendously. Got it. Thank you very much for Thank that explanation. Uh, next, we have a testimony and support from the Oahu Metropolitan Planning Organization. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 3242? If not, questions, members? No questions, thanks very much, Director Sniffen. We're gonna move on to the next measure. Senate Bill 2443, Senate Draft 2, House Draft 1, relating to highway safety. This measure establishes the Automated Speed Enforcement Systems Program to be implemented in at least one school or work zone in each county. It authorizes the state to administer the Automated Speed Enforcement Systems Program and creates a new offense of non-compliance with the posted speed limit under the automated speed enforcement system, and it appropriates funds. First up, we have, well, let's, let's go with Director Sniffen first, Department of Transportation. 
Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members, Ed Sniffin, and Hawaii DOT. We, we support this bill. Um, we feel it's an important one. For our system, uh, when we look at the, the numbers of fatalities out there, 35% uh, of the fatalities that occur are directly attributable to speeding. That's what caused the crash. But when we look at all the crashes that we have in the system, speed is the reason for those fatalities. So addressing those speed in, in different areas helps tremendously in helping keep everybody safe. We, we all know that our police forces are really good partners, but they can't be everywhere. So we're hopeful that we can put enforcement in different zones, especially where people are at risk, especially where we know there's gonna be a lot of pedestrians, a lot of bicyclists, like in school areas, to ensure that we can manage and maintain those speed limits in those areas effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have testimony from the Attorney General, Denise Wong, Deputy Attorney, Deputy Attorney General. Good Welcome. afternoon, Chair Tarnas, Vice Chair Takayama, and committee members. My name is Denise Wong, Deputy, um, Deputy Attorney General. Uh, we have submitted uh, written testimony providing comments. In sum, the bill attempts to impose liability on the registered owner of the motor vehicle for violation of the speed limit. Specifically, the bill authorizes the use of the automated speed <coughs> enforcement system program in the enforcement of HRS section 291C-102. However, this statute requires the driver of the motor vehicle and not the registered owner of the motor vehicle to comply with the speed limit. Therefore, um, we identify that there are five references to section 291C-102 in this bill that we recommend be replaced with references to the new uh, section 291C starting on page 12, uh, line 10 of the bill. I'm available for questions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have testimony from the judiciary, the Deputy Chief Court Administrator DeLima. On Zoom, please proceed. Aloha, Chair Tarnas, Vice Chair Takayama. My name is Ernest DeLima. I'm here on behalf of the judiciary regarding SB 2443. Um, I believe you're in receipt of our written testimony, um, and we would stand on that testimony at this time. Um, you know, I think we did have, uh, we noted a concern about the January 1st, 2025 start date uh, for different reasons. Um, in particular, uh, you know, we would need to kind of confer with the DOT on its implementation. Uh, there might be some enhancements that might be necessary to the judiciary's information management system. Uh, and then the neighbor islands where this is proposed to take place might need some additional resources to deal with uh, the increase in citations that might occur from this effort. So um, I think those are our main concerns at this time. And I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, there's only one other uh, uh, organization that indicated they wanted to give testimony, and that's the Honolulu Police Department, Major Tanaka. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Tarnas, uh, Vice Chair Takayama, members of the committee, Major Stacey Tanaka of HPD's Traffic Division, and uh, we are um, support of support of the bill, and um, we believe that any measures that um, contribute to um, the enforcement of speeding vehicles um, is necessary. Um, as higher speeds can equate to um, less reactionary time, as well as higher propensity for property damage and injuries. In addition, speeding is a major contributing factor to many of our motor vehicle collisions resulting in critical injuries and fatalities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all that said they wanted to testify, but I noticed that uh, we have, well, is there anyone else here wishing to testify on this measure? Anyone on Zoom wanting to testify on this measure? Senate Bill 2443. If not, questions, members. Vice Chair Takayama. For um, Director Sniffen, please. <clears throat> Director, you support this measure, and um, are you... Do we envision um, these speed cameras sighting people who are driving maybe 10 miles an hour over the posted speed limit? Uh, because there has to be some reasonable cushion, right? Absolutely, and, and we, we prefer <clears throat> discretion for police. Um, right now, police don't, don't ticket anybody that's going one mile per hour over the speed limit. They're looking at what area that driver's in, um, the, what types of speed they're driving in, and, and, what kind, and the way they're driving in that area. Uh, for us, we don't, condone, we, don't, we don't support ticketing 
at one mile per hour over the speed limit. Um, I think it's established right now that 10 miles per hour over the speed limit is the, is the cushion that everybody considers. Um, but if you ask police, um, like uh, Major Tanaka, he would tell you that there's different discretions in different areas um, that police use, and we would absolutely support that uh, in this bill as well. Okay. Um, the bill as it's uh, before us proposes to set up speed cameras in school zones. Um, what's the usual speed limit in school zones? Usually it's 25 miles per hour in, okay. sp in school zones. Um, I don't know. Schools in my area... Um, have a different speed limit when school is in session as opposed to not in session. So would these speed cameras be able to capture the differences um, from yes. day to day? Yes, it will. Uh, the, the speed cameras um, don't, don't really care what the, the speed limit is in those areas. We can, we can tell them what the speed limit is at different times, and it, and it, would, it would give us those infractions or those citations based on that. Okay. My last question, if I may, Sure. Sure. Yeah, ask um, plenty. <laughs> has to do with rook zones. Now what's the usual, is there a normal standard uh, speed limit in uh, rook zones? Not necessarily normal. So we, we set up work zone speeds based on the work that's, um, that's required in the area um, and the space that's available. So for an instance, on H1, when we have work zones at overnight, uh, when we have two lanes available, but we take up two lanes on the roadway, we keep the speed limits above 35 to 45 in that area. Um, but if we're in a constrained space where we'd have maybe only one, one lane of work and the workers are very close to it, it may go down to 25. So it just depends on the space that, that's available. We would set the camera based on that as well. Okay. It seems to me that, at least in some work zones that I've seen, that they move. I mean, when you pow one area, then you move to another area and, and cone off that part. So you would have to have the cameras recalibrated during maybe even during a work night or work day. Right? Yeah, so the way I envision work zone portions, we'd only be citing during uh, when those workers are, are on site, um, not, not when they're off. Uh, we would be looking at um, following through on the educational piece to ensure that the 60-day education, the 30-day uh, warning period always uh, apply to, to any of those areas. Um, so we would cover the, the area of the work versus not just this portion that they're in. Does that make sense? So we'll look at the corridor to make sure we cover the, the educational period. Then we would, only, they would only be setting up the cameras in the areas that the, 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 the crews would be working in. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just curious to know how portable these cameras are. <clears throat> so they would be just mounted on, on our, our light poles in okay. those different areas. So they'd have to re, be remounted? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. No more. Vice Chair, other questions? Not? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Director Sniffen. Okay, we're going to move on now <clears throat> to, oh, and, and we'll be making our decisions on these two bills after we hear all the testimony on all the bills and do it at the end of the agenda. Yeah. Okay, let's move on now to the Kalopapa bill, Senate Bill 2289, SD2 HD1, relating to Kalopapa requires the Department of Health to include in its annual report regarding Kalopapa settlement details and updated information as available regarding the permanent transfer to other governmental or qualified non-governmental entities of the powers and duties of state agencies over Kalopapa settlement. The measure requires the Department of Health to report on its community engagement efforts and it sunsets on the 1st June 30th after the reviser of statute, statutes receives a written gubernatorial proclamation that the reference transfer is complete. Okay, first up. We have the Department of Health. Thank you for being here. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Diana Felton, uh, Chief of the Communicable Disease and Public Health Nursing Division at the Department of Health. So Department of Health is in support of this bill. We're in the early stages of working with community, with, excuse me, with county and state partners uh, on the possibilities for the future of Kalapapa. And we're committed to getting community input in an equitable manner and hearing, excuse me, 
hearing all the voices. This includes our current patients, their families, and their descendants. It includes DHHL beneficiaries, Kaohana o Kalapapa, residents of Topside Molokai, and anyone else with an interest in the future of Kalapapa. The community engagement portion is very important to us and to our partners in DHHL and DLNR, and we're looking forward to hearing the community's input on what they feel may be best for the future of Kalapapa. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Next, we have testimony from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Welcome. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Michelle McCoy, Public Policy Advocate for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Chair, Vice Chair. Mahalo for uh, having this uh, bill on the agenda. We, you have our testimony in full support of this matter. Mahalo. I want to highlight why you think it's such a good bill. Well, it's very important that the, um, the many different uh, community members, um, it's my understanding that there is an issue with respect to a lapse in funding for the memorial, and which is why the, the coordination needs to um, be better uh, noticed. Um, there have been some meetings that have gone on, it's my understanding, with, with no minutes and uh, no information to um, uh, Kaohana. Uh, regarding the outcomes and, and what the decision making is and, and when the transfers will occur. So they're very concerned about the memorial especially. And uh, the legislature um, funded $5 million uh, from 2022. And so we're concerned about the lapse in that. Got it. Okay, thank you very much. Mahalo. Next we have testimony from Ka'ohana Okalopapa, Valerie Monson on Zoom. Please proceed. You want to unmute yourself? Sorry. Sorry, my apologies. No problem. Uh, aloha, aloha, Chair Tarnas, uh, Vice Chair Takayama, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Valerie Monson. I'm Executive Director of Ka'ohana Okalapapa. And um, this is our fourth hearing on this bill, and each time we hear something different from the departments. Uh, so we, we are now hearing that this transition team, which at the first meeting it was just little operational details, and the public would be involved when they felt it was the right time. Now at the last meeting we heard there's already been formed an executive team and that the public will not be included on the executive team and they're going to be searching for, fu for funding for an engagement coordinator to develop an engagement plan and then get the public involved. So to me, this sounds like this engagement plan is going to come up with a with a with a plan and the public is just going to be told you guys can comment on it rather than us be involved in the beginning in the process um, so we are asking you guys to please help please get the public involved at the beginning of this process the future of kalapapa is too important i agree with what the department of health said there are a lot of people who have a strong interest and deep love for Kalapapa, who want to have their voices heard here. And thank you, OHA, for bringing up the memorial, because you guys, the legislature, unanimously two years ago approved $5 million to build the memorial that we have been working on for 20 years. So much paperwork, so much approvals. We've gone through all these steps. Governor Ige signed the bill into law, and now we, we have not seen one penny of that money because of more requirements that we had never heard about. The letter from the Department of Health was signed by someone who had never even met with us with all of these new requirements. So we're asking you, please, get the public involved at the beginning. Um, you, you've got to do that for Lahaina, too. But when it comes to the future of, these, of, of any community, the public has to be the driving force. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. DeGray Vanderbilt. Take your time, sir. Come on up to the podium there, if you would. Use the microphone. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, 
I got this hat on from Molokai today. We, all the students were out there. And I lived on Molokai for over 30 years. And as a matter of fact, I was chairman of the Molokai Planning Commission uh, for a while. And uh, uh, so they asked me what I was doing over here. And I, I said, well, I'm going to testify on a bill. We're trying to have, make sure Molokai is involved uh, at the start before decisions are made on uh, what will happen to the future of Kalapapa. And all the students said, well, come on, we'll, we'll go testify. So I, I, I said, no, I, I, don't, I, think, I don't think that's necessary. They had to go home anyway. Uh, but I think uh, I remember at the Water and Land uh, uh, meeting on March 12th, all those uh, kids came up to talk about the uh, uh, water commission and and who controls the water and everything and they were I just I could have watched them all day they were just they were wonderful they were well prepared well spoken and as I said before um, if uh, I wish I could have recorded that and sent it back to Washington where most of our legislators back there don't even know how to put two sentences together but anyway, uh, yeah, my name is. Let's focus on the bill. Huh? <laughs> let's go ahead and focus on your comments oh, on the yeah, bill. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But anyway, uh, as I said, uh, I appreciate the water and land uh, amendments to uh, Senate Bill uh, 2289. And uh, I had just proposed a few, uh, uh, a couple of one word amendments just to provide some clarity and that I hope you'll consider. And um, I guess uh, what I wanted to mention was that um, the transition team started off in 2016, and it was called the transition team. And there were only government agencies on it. And then it changed their name to the Intergovernmental Agency Transition Team. And now recently it's called the Executive Transition Team. And uh, at the last meeting between Water and Land, DOH representatives said the executive transition team will not include Ka'ohana or a community organization from the topside community, which was one of the amendments that was put in the uh, bill last time by um, Water and Land. So I, I think we really want to be involved and move forward, and we think we can add both Kaohano and Kalapapa, which has just um, finished its 20 years of service down at the Kalapapa community, has won seven historic preservation awards from Historic Hawaii Foundation, can add a lot to this whole process, and in a topside community uh, also. And we talk about, there's, there's a lot of talk about a community engagement, but DOH and some of the other government agencies, their idea of uh, community agency is, is uh, we're going to meet, we're going to do this, this, and this, and work on a lot of stuff, and then we'll go out and find a community engagement specialist. We've got to find the funding for it, and then we'll involve the community. We, we, we think that they should be involved up front. And I just want to end by saying uh, Molokai will not, there's no need for hiring a community engagement specialist that doesn't know anything really about Molokai or Kalapapa. And I'd like to read something from, about Molokai. Uh, uh, Molokai, uh, of, it's uh, called Molokai Pule O'o. Molokai of the Powerful Prayer, and this was in a, a brochure published in 2008 called Molokai, Future of an Hawaiian Island. And basically it says, although Molokai is not self-governing today, her people are nevertheless respected for their ability to protect the Hawaiian culture, subsistence lifestyle, and natural resources upon which they are dependent. They have accomplished this by combining an intimate knowledge of the island's resources, strengths, and character, and fearless determination to deal with the threats of their environment and lifestyle. The enduring description of Molokai as the last Hawaiian island affirms the success of the community in protecting the Hawaiian way of life. 
as the core of the island's multi-ethnic, close-knit society. Molokai's modern-day stewards have a kuleana to care for the island as they would care for a member of their own family. So they ha we don't need to have hiring a community specialist. And hopefully, uh, at the next transition meeting, uh, the Department of Health and the other government agencies will welcome Ka Ohana Okala Papa at that meeting, along with a topside community Native Hawaiian organization. And I think both these organizations will add a lot to the discussion. And if I was one of the government agencies, I'd welcome them. So thank you very much. Certainly. Thank you very much, Mr. Vanderbilt. Uh, next, we have testimony in support from two individuals, Lori Buchanan and Wally Inglis. Uh, is there anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 2289? If not, questions, members? I have a question for the Department of Health. Yes, sir. I'm not clear uh, whether Department of Health is, are you already in the process of adding members that we're talking about here, or is this language to mandate you to do that? Uh, I, I'd like to try to address that. Um, Debbie Kim Morikawa, I'm the Deputy Director for the Department of Health. And I, I just want to make a few, I appreciate the time to clarify. There were some more official meetings that were referred to as transition team meetings. However, more recently, what's happened is that it really was initiated by Senator Dela Cruz. He really wanted to see what the outcome was going to be for Kalapapa and looking at a specific transition plan. Well, we weren't really in the position to be able to put together a plan because there are so many jurisdictional issues. So what we did provide to uh, Kaohana as well as anybody else who would like it is basically what we refer to as our punch list. So the meetings that we're having are with the department heads of DHHL, DLNR, and DOH, as well as our staff to really talk about a lot of these issues. And I'm just gonna go through the list so you get an example of the kinds of things that are being discussed. Us. So, of course, the first um, priority was jurisdiction, because right now it's under the ju jurisdiction of the DOH. However, when the last patient passes, DOH is basically going to be exiting, and there's going to be a county, but we don't know who's going to be taking over that county. It seems to make sense that Maui County may be a good uh, option for that, but we would need to then confer with Maui County Mayor. So we have been in discussions with the Maui County Mayor, and he's been involved with this. However, there's been no decision made. Again, everything right now is just looking at what are all of the different options. So this punch list has jurisdictional issues, looks at facilities, law enforcement, emergency services, fire suppression, airport, vehicle registration, fishing regulations, hunting regulations, access to the county itself, because right now there's only two means of access through the airport, which is access through a nine-seat airpl um, airplane. And then from topside, um, you have to go through private property. So technically speaking, no one can access it from topside at the current time. We're also looking at um, utilities, water, electricity, um, telecommunications, sewage, solid waste management. That's another critical issue because there are several landfills that we're trying to deal with right now. There are a lot of um, waste issues. Uh, there's a construction and demolition um, uh, landfill that we're, 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 again, trying to figure out getting funding to deal with all of these um, landfill issues. There's an animal waste and animal carcass pit. There's green waste, hazardous materials. Along the shorelines, there are vehicles that have been abandoned there. Again, trying to determine, okay, what is that cleanup gonna look like? Who's gonna take responsibility for it? How do we coordinate with a barge to get all of those vehicles off? Land and zoning. DOH is kind of the lead right now. However, we're not the landowners. The land belongs to DHHL and DLNR. They each have par parcels. So really looking at who's gonna be taking those things over. Um, there's things like liquor control, zoning, um, uh, coastal management. So these are the kinds of issues that we, as a state, state agencies, are trying to figure out who's going to take responsibility, how is that going to occur, um, what is the funding that's going to be needed that we would have to come to the legislature for. So they're not really community issues as of yet. 
The community issues really that Diana was referring to is the fact that we do want to get input from the community as to what they see as a vision for the future of Kalaupapa. So we do want to hire a facilitator who will take us through that process, somebody independent from government who can help convene all of the different stakeholders to look at what are the different things that the community would like to see, what are their concerns. And so that process is what Diana was referring to. It's not to come up with a plan, it's really to set up a process for the community to be engaged in the process of looking at what that future will be. Okay, and then in terms of membership on this organization, uh, like I say, I'm, not, I'm just not clear, where are you in terms of the membership? Because part of this bill is to mandate you include certain organizations as members. Right, and as far as that portion of the bill, what we had in indicated, which was taken a little out of context, is that right now, it's really more of an administrative issue. A lot of the issues we're talking really don't involve a, a community organization, that we would bring the community organizations at a point where we were ready to look at, okay, let's now look at the decisions that need to be made about what's going to be the future of Kalapapa. Right now, we're just looking at making sure that we can keep it as pristine as possible. What is that funding going to look like? Who's going to take responsibility for it? Who's going to transition out? Because when we go, there may still be a lot of issues that need to um, to continue to be I'm sorry, remediated. So again, that's where we're at. And we said that we would bring in the organizations at the point where those kinds of discussions um, would be fruitful. We don't want to wait too long though, however, so that's why we talked about the community engagement piece that in the meantime, all of the community organizations would be able to come together. I do want to say that our Hansen's Disease Branch has actually engaged directly with Ka'ohana. They meet periodically as well as they've reached out to them to get their input. So we have been in communication directly with them. They just have not been part of these types of meetings, which is really not appropriate at this time. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, other questions, members? Other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Department of Health, uh, to Mr. Vanderbilt. Appreciate you coming all the way over for this. And uh, we're going to now go back to the top of our agenda. We'll make decisions on this bill and the other two we just heard at the very end of the agenda. So we'll catch up. Have a safe flight, sir. Okay, we're going to go back up to the top of the agenda. Senate Bill 3364, Senate Draft 2, H Dra uh, House Draft 1, relating to destination management. This measure requires the Hawaii Tourism Authority to develop destination management action plans for each county and to perform specific actions in each plan. It expands the powers and duties of the Hawaii Tourism Authority, repeals the exemption of the Hawaii Tourism Authority from administrative supervision of boards and commissions, renames the Tourism Marketing Plan as the Strategic Tourism Management Plan, and amends the required components of the plan. Finally, it requires the Strategic Tourism Management Plan to include statewide destination management and regenerative tourism efforts and programs. First up, we have the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Ilya Johnson, welcome. Please proceed. Mahalo. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, distinguished members. Ilya Johnson for the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Um, I'll stand on our supportive testimony. Just wanted to call out a couple of things. You know, destination management is at the heart of what we do in today's HTA. Um, covered under 201B3, there are a lot of things that we can do to manage the destination. This measure makes it very explicit that destination management is a core function of ours as we have been carrying it out. And it makes explicit that we should do these destination management action plans that are community-led, government-supported, uh, and have been broadly embraced by communities across Hawaii. When we think of some examples of destination management, Chair, in your district, the Polaloo Stewards Program was one of our early successes. Uh, when I say our, meaning the entire community that wrapped around to make that successful. These destination management actions can be small. If we come to the island of Oahu, at Cocoa Head, there was a mismatch between uh, the opening of parking gates and the opening of the park that allows folks to access sunrise hikes on Cocoa Head, we were able to resolve that in partnership with the city by purchasing a timed, uh, automatic timed lock to open up that parking gate. And then to the more 
auspicious projects over on your island, Rep Miyake, the East Maui Tourism Management Pilot Project, which is in progress now, placing stewards at various places with various jurisdictions along the road to Hana, tackling some of the issues that that community has been facing for some time now. So this is work that we're poised and eager to continue doing, and we appreciate your support. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Mahalo. Next, we have testimony from Ho'omana Pono, Demand Kalai Manaole. Not present. And we have uh, supportive testimony from the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement, Kohala Coast Resort Association, Maui Hotel and Lodging Association, Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association, and Keone Shizuma, and Pamela Tumpop, Maui Chamber of Commerce. Uh, is there anyone on Zoom or in the room here wishing to provide oral testimony, testimony on Senate Bill 3364? If not, questions, members? Any questions? Because HTA is doing a great job. Thanks, Ilya. I think we're all set. We're going to move on to the next measure. Senate Bill 2503, relating to equity. This measure requires all places of public accommodation and state building constructions constructed after December 31st, 2024 to provide universal changing accommodations that are equally accessible regardless of gender. Requires state building construction projects that are bid after June 30th, 2025 to include universal changing accommodations that are equally accessible regardless of gender when doing so is feasible and cost effective. First up, we have testimony from Daintree Bartoldus, State Council on Development Developmental Disabilities. Thank Welcome. you, Chair, Committee Members. Dane Schwartz was Executive uh, Director, excuse me, Executive Administrator for the Hawaii State Council on Developmental Disabilities. We stand in strong support of this measure. Um, basically, what it is is just allowing individuals who cannot use a toilet due to their disability a, a safe, a clean, dignified area to be changed. Um, Non-gender specific because sometimes it's a male and a female that will go in that help they need assistance. So it might be a husband, wife, it might be a staff that's helping the person. So we just feel that it's just appropriate, like um, to come to the Capitol and submit testimony if someone need to use the bathroom, they need to use a place to change. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. Certainly, thank you very much. Uh, Michael Goloyu, uh, Stonewall Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii, not present. Uh, Tina Yamaki, Retail Merchants of Hawaii, not present. Uh, Jerry Sugano. Welcome. Please Good proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Tarnas, Vice Chair Takayama, members of the committee. My name is Jerry Sugano, and I stand on my written testimony in strong support. You want to tell us why this is important? Sure, absolutely. Um, state buildings like the state capitol have no changing facilities for my daughter, individuals like my daughter, my daughter is 15 years old now. She cannot access the infant changing tables because she's too heavy for them. Therefore, when we come to state facilities, we have to decide whether we're gonna change her standing up, put her on the ground, and we carry all those supplies with us, or we have to decide whether to bring her at all. Um, oftentimes, we have to rush. If we come out in, in public, we have to get out, do our business, and rush home um, in the event that she has to utilize the bathroom because she's incontinent. So those are concerns that um, many parents like us face when we have to take our children who are not infants out into everyday society. Um, the reality is I have to take her everywhere that she needs to go in terms of doctor visits and um, state visits because... Um, her father cannot go and change her in the restroom with other men in the, in the restroom. So as it was stated before, these accommodations would be very helpful for not just children like my daughter, but older adults as well. And we appreciate your support. Thank you very much. I appreciate you, you sharing your personal information and uh, experience. Next, we have testimony from James Labrie. Come up right next to the podium and move the microphone down so it can reach them. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members. My name is James Libri, and I stand on my written testimony in full support of this measure because 
I am a person that needs to be changed in public, that uh, sometimes I may need a male or female to come in with me to change, but due to, due to not having the right uh, resources or the right accommodations to have a male and a female to come in to the changing room, I feel like we we should be able to change in a public or state facility, given that anybody with a disability has a urgent need to change because Anybody with an urgent need to change, especially for myself, I'm incontinent, so I would need two person assist, and it could be male or female, or vice versa. Thank you for your support, and yeah, thank you for your support, and thank you for hearing this measure. Thank you, Mr. Labrie. I appreciate your leadership. <coughs> Thanks for being here today, providing testimony. Next uh, testimony from Terry Heady. In support, on Zoom? Not present. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 2503? Please come on up, introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Austin Kanashiro. I am Jerry Sugano's son. Now, like my mom was saying, this bill is really important because if my sister has to, my sister uses the restroom, we can't find, we are not able to find a place for her to change her pants. And we'll have to like either find a bathroom and put her on the floor or run back to, the, to our car. So installing these universal changing tables in public would allow people like my sister to have a place to use a restroom rather than having to just have her on the floor or rush back home. And it's also important because if there was one in this building, everyone should be able to come here or go to come to the Capitol or go to state building without having to worry about it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Certainly, thank you for your testimony. Thanks for standing up for your sister. Anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? If not, questions, members? Not, thanks very much. And I appreciate all the testifiers on this. Uh, just to make sure everyone knows, we've, we've given the testimony that you provided to us to all the members. Many of them are watching from their offices right now. And uh, so we do read the testimony. And I do appreciate you taking the time to come here in person as well. It's very compelling. So thank you very much. We're going to go on to the other uh, um, bills. And then we'll make decisions on this at the very end of the agenda. You're welcome to stay. but. Uh, we do have a number of bills to go through before we get to decision making. Okay, next up we have Senate Bill 2286, Senate Draft 2, House Draft 1, relating to internships. This permits and appropriates monies for the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations to enter into contracts with eligible employers or registered apprenticeship programs in the private sector to provide on-the-job training to eligible interns. Provides that the state shall be the responsible employer for purposes of workers' compensation coverage when a student or a recent graduate performs paid or unpaid work for a private or public employer as part of the on-the-job training work experience program. Requires the Department of Human Services Development to collaborate with the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations for certain portions of the program. And it specifies that workers' compensation coverage for a recent graduate shall lapse on the last day of February of the graduating year for fall semester graduates and on July 31st of the graduating year for spring semester graduates. On this measure, first up, we have the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations. Director Jade Butai, welcome. Please proceed. Uh, good, up, uh, good afternoon, Chair Tarnas, uh, Vice Chair Takayama, and committee members. Uh, Jade Butai for DLIR. Uh, we stand on our testimony in support of this measure and request uh, some amendments. Uh, this measure is intended to authorize uh, state-funded uh, internships in the private sector, but subsections I and J uh, pertain to the pre-existing uh, Heli Mua 
internship program uh, using state funds for state internships that we collaborate uh, with the DHERD or uh, therefore the, you know, we suggest uh, deleting these provisions. Uh, we also recommend um, amending subsection J to put in a new section of chapter 394 with amended language. Uh, so our report on the internship, uh, internship program covers both the existing state program as well as the private sector one proposed by this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we have testimony from the Department of Education. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Tammy Chun, Department of Education, standing on a written testimony in support. Would you like to highlight your testimony, please, for those who hadn't had a chance to read it? Sure. Uh, we support having more opportunities for our high school students to have on-the-job experiences, including student internships, and this bill allows for that. We're currently collaborating with the um, DLIR to provide uh, internship opportunities through the Hele Umoa program. Uh, the bill, importantly for the Department of Education, has a section that extends the workers' compensation coverage for this students who are doing internships for students who have recently graduated because currently once students graduate, they're no, lo no longer covered for uh, workers' compensation if they're participating in a school-based program and this would allow students to complete their work-based learning programs um, just immediately after graduation to help with employment. Could you explain the amendment that you're seeking? Yes. Just a second here. So the amendment that we're seeking, uh, we're, we're, we're deferring to the Department of Labor here with regard to the on-the-job training program, and we actually prefer the language in the um, previous version of the bill. Uh, this would, we think it's um, just clearer in terms of saying that we want our graduates to do paid or unpaid work uh, as part of school-approved work-based learning program sponsored by DOE or the University of Hawaii, as opposed to the current language. And this is to make it clear that uh, workers' compensation coverage would be provided for those students? Correct. Got it. Okay. Anything else? Any other highlights? Okay. That's all. All right. Thank you very much. Next, we have University of Hawaii. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, member of the committee, Debbie Halbert, Vice President for Academic Strategy. We stand on our written testimony in support and to highlight some of the key factors. We, of course, believe internships are a valuable part of the higher education experience. It is designated both statewide and nationally as a high impact practice for success post-graduation. We, of course, would defer to DLIR on the operational components of this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Hawaii Tourism Authority. In support. Next, we have Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii in support, Eliza Talbot. Next, we have Hawaii Food Industry Association, Lauren Zerbell, not present, in support. And then testimony and support from three organizations, Hawaii Farm Bureau, Kohala Coast Resort Association, and Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association, in support from, also from the Maui Chamber of Commerce, and then also support from Jerry Sugano. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 2286? Yes. You're heard, welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Dennis, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Sharon Heard, Department of Agriculture. I, I, my, my comment is in support, but the, uh, the comment is also that we've been very successful with the leadership of uh, Director Boutte with the Heli Moore program. And if this program is to provide on-the-job, real-life training, workers' comp is part of it. They should know the, that they have workers' comp should they begin to work in the real world. In fact, by having the Helio Moore program, we have actually attracted two employees, and the two that are in the pipeline right now have indicated that as soon as they graduate, they're gonna apply for a position at the department. So work, workers' comp is part of it. They should experience the, the benefits of that as well. Thank you for the thank, opportunity. Thank you very much. Appreciate your spontaneous testimony. 
Anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? If not, questions, members? Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you very much to the testifiers. Next, Senate Bill 2291, Senate Draft 2, House Draft 1, relating to advisory boards. This measure establishes advisory boards focused on workforce development for the Agribusiness Development Corporation, the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation, and Natural Energy Laboratory of Hawaii Authority. First up, we have Jade Butai, Hawaii Department of Labor and Industrial Relations. Uh, aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, and committee members. Uh, Jade Butai for DLIR. Uh, we stand on our testimony in support. Uh, you know, this measure would have uh, the di director of DLIR or designee uh, serve on newly created workforce advisory boards for the Agribusiness Development Corporation, uh, Hawaii Technology Development Corporation, and the Natural Ener Energy Laboratory of Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've received testimony and support from the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, the Agribusiness Development Corporation, uh, Hawaii Farm Bureau, and Hawaii Food and Policy, Purple Maya Foundation. Uh, and then we've got testimony and support from the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation, Wayne Inouye. Welcome. Aloha, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Wayne Inouye, representing uh, HTDC. Uh, we stand on our written testimony in support of this bill. Um, I think, as you, we all know, workforce is a big issue for the state of Hawaii, and HCDC is committed to innovation and skilled labor. So I think the collaboration of working together with smart people in supporting workforce and not having people work in silos is a great benefit to the state. So we stand in our written testimony to support this bill. So thank you for uh, the opportunity to testify. Sure. Thanks thank very you. much for being here. Next, we have testimony and support from the Local Food Coalition, Myung Ho Oh. Uh, next, we have testimony and support from the Hawaii Farmers Union United, Kaipo Kekona, not present. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 2291 HD1? If not, questions, members? I have a question. Let me ask um, Director Butai, perhaps. For these different advisory boards, it's not uh, explicit in this, this bill what kind of expertise or experience the members would have or the candidates would have for these boards. Is that something that could be handled by each of the different agencies in, in their recruitment of board members is to identify the sort of skill set that they're looking for in board members rather than put it in statute? Yeah, I think it's uh, just just the composition of the, the board, I think, can you know, like, you know, from labor, we would have a, you know, working with our workforce development, we would know what the, what those industries that uh, needs a lot of uh, workforce. And then you, you know, you get the DOE, so you kind of align everybody. Uh, so I'll leave that up to you to tailor made it. At, uh, you can customize it for each of the different advisory boards as needed. Yes. Rather than putting in statute, that's right. Yeah, I'm I would, I would, yeah, leave, give the flexibility. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, great, thank you, I appreciate that. Any other questions, members? If not, we'll move on. Thank you very much to the testifiers. Let's move on to Senate Bill 2615, Senate Draft 1, House Draft 1, relating to county labor standards. This measure authorizes the counties to require employers to disclose information regarding its employees' wages, benefits, hours, and employment status and deny, revoke, or suspend a building permit application for violating laws relating to wages, benefits, hours, and employment status under certain conditions. On this measure, first up, Jade Butai, Depar Department of Labor and Industrial Relations. Uh, good afternoon again, Chair, Vice Chair, and committee members. Uh, we stand on our testimony in support uh, and you know, that authorizes the counties to enact uh, ordinances requiring employers to disclose information and deny, revoke, or suspend building permits for violations of labor laws. Uh, the ordinances would su supplement uh, state and federal labor laws that would not affect uh, state and federal investigations. And it would, complement, uh, would play a complementary role in encouraging adherence to labor laws 
uh, designed to protect the welfare and livelihood of our local workforce. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next person that said they would testify is uh, Mr. Kinney from Hawaii Regional Council of Carpenters. Welcome, sir. Please proceed. Afternoon, Chair, members. Nathaniel Kinney, Hawaii Regional Council of Carpenters. Uh, we stand in support of the measure uh, with uh, some comments. Uh, we wanted to maybe hope that the committee could narrow the definition rather than require all employers, rather just require contractors as defined in HRS section 444-1 uh, so that it isn't all employers but just contractors in which we've seen uh, various violations of labor laws. So just contractors rather than all employers. And then in review, right before the committee, I apologize, uh, we would, would hope that the committee could uh, entertain the notion of uh, deny, revoke, or suspend a building permit, comma, building and building permit applications if a contractor is found to be in violation of the law. We just don't want it to be overly broad. Uh, some, some, some members of the business community felt that it was overly broad, so we wanted to narrow it to really focus in on the, the part of the economy where we feel like the most egregious examples are occurring. Thank very you. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have testimony from the Pacific Resource Partnership. Mr. Delani. Aloha, Chair and uh, committee members. Chris uh, Delaney with Pacific Resource Partnership. Strong support of the bill. Um, this bill does not require it. It allows each county to have the power to um, adopt labor standards. And it also gives another tool in the compliance toolbox um, to tackle these um, unscrupulous, to prevent unscrupulous contractors from coming into the state of Hawaii. And um, doing these types of practices where they uh, basically don't pay the proper wages, don't comply with the proper laws and pay the proper um, taxes to the state. And what they do is they do these practices and leave. Um, sometimes they get caught by the Department of Labor or US Department of Labor and they get fines, but they usually complete the project. And then sometimes they come back for more right after they do that. It's a business model that's um, unscrupulous and it's actually detrimental to the working people of Hawaii. <clears throat> um, so we think this bill will give the, the counties the opportunity to play a role in this compliance um, strategy working with in conjunction with Department of Labor as well as the various other departments that handle um, construction types of um, work and violations, overseas construction work and violations. And um, yeah, so we just want to emphasize our strong support, and um, um, we ask for your favorable decision on this measure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delaunay. Uh, we've received testimony from numerous other organizations and individuals, but that's all who said they would testify here today. Is there anyone else here wishing to testify in Senate Bill 2615? If not, questions, members? Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you very much to the testifiers. We'll go on now to Senate Bill 2562, relating to veterinary medicine. This measure prohibits individuals without a valid, unrevoked license obtained from the Hawaii Board of Veterinary Medicine or operating under the direct supervision of the same from performing any surgical procedure on any pet animal. It makes performing any surgical procedure on any pet animal without a valid, unrevoked license obtained from the Hawaii Board of Veterinary Medicine or operating under the direct supervision of the same a Class C felony. It makes cropping and docking offenses of cruelty to animals in the first degree. First up, we have testimony from the Hawaii Board of Veterinary Medicine. Good afternoon, Chair Tarnas, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Carrie Shahan. I'm the Executive Officer of the Hawaii Board of Veterinary Medicine. We're going to stand on our testimony, but I would like to bring up uh, two items from our written testimony. The first would be uh, direct supervision on line 16, page three. We would recommend changing that to supervision, striking direct, because starting in July, we're going to have relief and courtesy permits, and the uh, veterinarians operating under those may operate under either direct or indirect supervision. 
and we would not want to limit their ability to practice veterinary medicine. We'd also like to uh, ask that the fines and penalties listed on page four, line 10, be commensurate with chapter 706, bringing the fine up to $1,000 and up to one year of uh, incarceration. And lastly, uh, the board feels that cropping and docking as customarily practiced in livestock management should be added so we can protect our livestock producers in the state. I'll be available for questions if you have any later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have testimony from the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Chair Hurd. Good afternoon again, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Sharon Hurd, Department of Agriculture. I'm here on behalf of the livestock industry, as the previous testifier said. These, the cropping and docking is an acceptable practice for livestock management and to consider it being a illegal Class C felony is a, really a threat to the industry and the fact that they've been doing it for years. L lastly, they, are not, they don't practice cruelty to animals. This is something for livestock management. It's accepted, and they've been doing it for years successfully. Um, so we ask, as the previous testifier, to once again include as an exception cropping or docking as customarily practiced. Thank you very much for allowing the testimony. Thank you very much. Next, we have testimony from Hawaiian Humane Society. Aloha, Chair Tarnas, Vice Chair Takayama, and committee members, Stephanie Kendrick with the Hawaiian Humane Society. Um, thank you to the committee for hearing this version of this bill. Uh, this bill's gone through the ringer a little bit this session. Um, there's House version, which you guys are familiar with as well. Uh, the intent of this measure was never to apply to the livestock industry. It was always to be limited to pet animals. We think this current version makes that clear, um, and it, it will do quite a lot to protect animals that we see coming into our shelters, both on Oahu and on the neighbor islands that have been victimized by backyard surgeries done without anesthetic, without clean surgical equipment. Uh, we need to make sure that surgeries on our pet animals are being done by veterinarians, and this measure would help us accomplish that. So I urge the committee to give it your support, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have testimony from the Hawaii Veterinary Medical Association. Good afternoon, committee chairs and members. My name is Dr. Jill Yoshisato. I'm a veterinarian and executive vice president of the Hawaii Veterinary Medical Association. So I'm here today to represent HVMA and to share our support of the intent of this bill and our, a few of our concerns with the language in the bill. Our first concern is ensuring the surgery restriction is appropriately placed to address the current loophole allowing pet owners to perform uh, veterinary treatment on their own pets. Uh, the language in HB 1527 places the surgery restriction in section 1A2, which is directly adjacent to the pet owner exemption. And we feel this makes it clear that while pet owners are legally allowed to treat their own pets, they're not allowed to do surgery on them. SB 2562 currently places the surgery restriction separately in section 1B, and this does not uh, address the pet owner loophole in section 1A. Additionally, if there are any concerns with prohibiting surgery by non-veterinarians outside of the pet owner relationship, this is already prohibited in veterinary practice law. <coughs> the purpose of this bill would be to specifically close the pet owner loophole. The other concern we have is the unintended con consequences on livestock practices in the state, uh, as previously mentioned. We request the addition of a specific exemption for accepted livestock practices to be added to Section 3.2. And our final concern would be regarding the exemption for cropping and docking in Section 3.2 would be to remove ear cropping. And um, Senator Richards, when we were discussing with him, he specifically asked us whether the HVMA would support uh, tail docking and dew claw removal within three days of age. And we did say that we would support that. Um, so that's why that specific language is in our revised testimony. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share our concerns, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Next, we have testimony from the Hawaii Cattlemen's Council, Nicole Galase, not present. Next, testimony from Animal Welfare Institute. I think 
Jessica Gibson, uh, please proceed. <laughs> Hello, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members. Thank you so much for this opportunity. In strong support, um, as our written testimony reflects, um, we thought the bill was good to go, having conferred with many of these same stakeholders over the months. Um, this closes a loophole that's been present in our animal cruelty statute, which is what we're most concerned with, 711-1108.5, which essentially allows any person, not a veterinarian, any person to perform cropping or docking on any pet animal, uh, regardless of, of, as Stephanie mentioned, any kind of licensing, um, access to pain medications or other. Um, and having heard the comments uh, from some other <laughs> folks, I think we're generally fine with the Department of Agriculture's comments, clarifying the penalties. Um, we're fine with the uh, uh, Veterinary Medical Board's uh, request um, to remove direct supervision. We all want to see more veterinarians and vet techs trained to perform, you know, spay neuter surgeries to keep our pet population down. Um, and the Veterinary uh, Medical Association's uh, uh, amendments sound um, also very reasonable. The one thing um, that we are most concerned with is, is this sudden exemption for any person to crop or, do or excuse me, dock or essentially amputate any pet animal, again, not livestock, any pet animal's toes or tails. I mean, these are considered amputations. Uh, the National American Veterinary Medical Association opposes um, cropping or docking because it's primarily done for cosmetic purposes. If there's a medical reason that this needs to be performed, absolutely. Um, but then again, if it's a medical reason, it needs to be performed by a veterinarian. So unfortunately, um, we feel that amending this bill, you know, to address a loophole is just creating another loophole. And um, in, in closing, I just want to emphasize, as you know, well, um, Chair, that and when you read the title of the bill, this specifically relates to pet animals. 711-1108.5, our felony animal cruelty statute, only relates to pet animals. Um, if there needs to be further clarification in the veterinary medical portion of this bill, that this does not apply to livestock, we believe um, the existing language is solid, but we would not object to that. But we could not support, you know, opening up our entire felony animal cruelty statute, redefining uh, definitions, um, which is what would be required because we're not opening up 711, 1100 where the definitions are. A pet animal is, is clear. Uh, we have never encountered a case where a legitimate farmer or rancher has ever been charged, let alone prosecuted. That is not the intent of the bill. However, we have seen horrific backyard botch surgeries on dogs. You can't even call them surgery. So that is the intent. And thank you so much, Chair and members, for your consideration. Mahalo. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. Next, we have testimony from the Hawaii Veterinary Medical Association. Jill Yoshisedo already said. Okay, great. Is there, uh, there, we've re also received testimony from numerous individuals. Is there anyone else wishing to testify on Senate Bill 2562? If not, questions, members? Seeing none, we'll move on. Thanks. We, we, we're, very, we're familiar with this issue. We did have a House bill on this very same issue, House Bill 1527, earlier on in the session. Okay, let's move on to the next measure. Thank you to the testifiers. Senate Bill 3236, relating to the Land Trust Act. This measure clarifies that if no personal property designation appears in the recorded instrument, the interests of the beneficiaries shall be real property. On this, we have testimony from the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Yes, uh, I'm not sure if I'm on. Yes, we see you, Apologies. Director Watson. Please go ahead. Thank you. I apologize. I'm on the Maui for a commission meeting. But in any event, uh, I'd like to uh, first uh, thank you, Chair, as well as Vice Chair and members of the committee for hearing this uh, bill. It's a very, very important bill for us because on the projects where we participate in the low-income housing tax credit approach to address the, low pe the people in the low-income level, it's very critical that uh, we deal with this 15-year delay regarding the compliance period in which by separating the vertical construction from the land, we'll be able to issue a, a lease, a homestead lease up front rather than that lessee waiting 15 years before he can do this conversion. That eliminates the problem whereby if they should pass away during that 15-year period, their uh, successors may uh, lose out. 
on the, the value as well as the transfer of the property to them. So this uh, changes it and allows us to separate the land from the vertical construction and its financing. And we uh, hope that you will support the measure uh, because it's definitely needed for our program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there may be some questions, so let me just check, see if there's anyone else wishing to testify on this measure here? If not, questions, members? Um, I do have a question, uh, Chairman Watson, I could ask you, um, if, if there is no personal property designation, I, I'm unclear as to why the interest of the beneficiaries would default to just real property and not both real property and personal property. Uh, it, it's just unclear whether adding uh, personal property would affect the purported intent of this measure, which I understand is to assist DHHL beneficiaries participating in HHFDC's Low Income Housing Tax Credits Program. But if, if this measure would affect the interpretation, this measure will affect the interpretation of all recorded instruments, not just those related to DHHL beneficiaries. So there might be some unintended consequences. So I'm just, it, it's unclear whether a beneficiary with a homestead lease can place Hawaiian home lands, which are already held in a trust, in another land trust. Could you help me understand this better? Yeah, it, it really uh, goes to the, the bottom portion, the land portion. Uh, you know, in talking with our attorneys, they were the ones that uh, said there's some, uh, I guess, confusion as to whether or not if the, the particular transfer is silent, whether it's uh, personal versus real property, that, you know, there is that ambiguity that needs to be resolved. So it's very clear that the vertical construction is real property as well as the land, which we know is it's land trust uh, property, but uh, I think it's more relative to the, uh, the personal property ambiguity regarding the vertical construction. We want to eliminate that. So you want to make it clear that it's the defaulting to real property only? Correct. Got it. Okay. I hope you understand it. I hope you and your attorneys understand it. Yeah, they, they, yeah, I'm relying on Mitchie Manaka and uh, David uh, Lau. Okay, well, this if the committee decides to move this on, uh, it will then move to finance. Um, there may be some other questions uh, from people who really understand real estate law better than I do in finance committee, so you might want to have you and your attorney show up so that you can answer the questions. Cause uh, I want to support you in this effort because it sounds like you really need it, the bill. Um, but, uh, you know, Finance Committee might have some additional questions for you. So we'll thank you very much. Do you have any final thank comments? Aloha. Aloha. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, members? If not, thank you very much. Let's move on to... Senate Bill 2512, Senate Draft 2, House Draft 1. Just for the members who weren't here, we've already heard the Kalapapa Bill. So we're going on to 2512, relating to emergency management powers. This measure establishes notice and reporting requirements for the transfer of public monies by the governor pursuant to the governor's emergency powers. On this measure, we have testimony from the Department of Budget and Finance in writing with comments. Anyone else here wishing to testify on this measure? If not, no one asked questions of, so we'll move on to the next measure, Senate Bill 3305, relating to education. This is our last measure before we go to decision making. Senate Bill 3305, HD1, relating to education. This measure requires all public charter schools that offer pre-kindergarten programs exclusively to adhere to the provisions of Chapter 302D Hawaii revised statutes with certain exceptions. On this measure, we have first up testimony from the Executive Office on Early Learning. Come on up. Everyone on, on TV wanna, wants to see you. Please stand at the podium and tell us what you, why you think this is a good bill, or tell us what you think. Thank you, High Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Yuko Arikawa Cross, Director of the Executive Office on Early Learning. Uh, we stand in, on our written testimony and support. Uh, currently, the charter pre-Ks are pre-K only, so they do not have K-12 um, 
students, and so that's where the uh, we are in support of this measure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have testimony from the State Public Charter School Commission. Welcome. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Hi, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Ed No, the Executive Director at the Charter School Commission. Welcome. Welcome aboard. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. We do stand on our written testimony just to clarify what Yuko just shared. Because it is a pre-K only, it, just, it would make exempt from certain things that apply to PK-12, like athletics, uh, computer science, um, in, um, internships that was discussed earlier today. So this would really let us focus only on the pre-K and open up more equity and access for our, our young students. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we've also received testimony support from Hawaii Children's Action Network Speaks and from Parents and Children Together. Is there anyone else wishing to testify in Senate Bill 3305? If not, questions, members? Nope. Seeing none, thank you very much to all the testifiers. We will now move on to decision making. So we're going to take a brief recess till we get quorum. Recess. We're reconvening our uh, House Committee on Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs hearing. It's uh, Tuesday, March 19th. Uh, it's now 3.17 p.m. And we're reconvening the committee hearing for decision making. First up, we have Senate Bill 3364, Senate Draft 2, House Draft 1. Members, I would like to move this out with technical amendments only. Questions or concerns, members? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 3364, SD2, HD2, Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Representative Evslin, <laughs> excused. Representative Ganadin, aye. Representative Holt, aye. Representative Ichiyama, excused. Representative Ilgon, aye. Representative Kong, excused. Representative Miyake, aye. Representative Souza, aye. Recommendations adopted. Thank you. On the next measure, Senate Bill 2503, Senate Draft 2, House Draft 1. I'd like to recommend we move this out with amendments. Uh, I want to note that the questions in the testifiers and request to remove the words feasible and cost effective, I think is really a finance decision, so I'll leave that to them. Uh, and um, I would, it was brought up by one of the testifiers about the dates. Um, currently, the bill says that. State building construction constructed after December 31st, 2024 has to provide these universal, universal changing accommodation. <clears throat> but bids for state building construction project, projects don't need to include universal changing accommodations until July 1st, 2025. So that doesn't quite work. So I'm going to recommend that uh, we change the date so that we require state building construction constructed after December 31st, 2026 to include, uh, excuse me, 2025, to include, uh, uh, to provide universal changing accommodations. That way it'll work, the timing should work. Bids, bids after July 1st, 2025 have to include it. So we're saying the state buildings constructed after December 31st, 2025 have to include these universal changing accommodations. I'd also like to include a severability clause uh, in here because uh, there, uh, that way that if there's a certain portion of this bill that's determined to be unconstitutional, the rest of the bill would still remain valid. Uh, I'd also like to make some technical amendments uh, for clarity, consistency, and style. Uh, those are my recommendations. Questions or concerns, members? 
If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2503 SD2 HD2, um, noting the excused absences of Representatives Evelyn. Noting the excused absence of Representatives uh, um, Ichiyama. He's Paul. here. Ichiyama's oh, here. I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay, um, let's see. Noting the excuse absence of Representative Kong. All members, um, all other members being present, anyone wishing to vote um, with reservations or no? Seeing none, Chair, your recommendations adopted. Thank you. Moving on to the next measure, Senate Bill 2286, Senate Draft 2, House Draft 1. I'd like to recommend we move this out with amendments. Um, after consulting with the Chair of Labor uh, and Government Operations Committee uh, and looking at the proposed amendments, we're taking a uh, part, uh, we're trying to address the uh, concerns brought up by the Department of Education uh, that we will amend on Section 5, uh, in Section 5, on page 11, line 14, after the words uh, private or public employer, we will add these words uh, next. So it will read, uh, for a private or public employer, as part of a school-approved work-based learning program sponsored by the Department of Education or University of Hawaii, and then continue, or as part of the on-the-job training work experience program established in Section 394-blank. So we'll add that. Uh, we will also um, uh, let's see. We will also add. Uh, we will give DLIR explicit authority to conduct background checks to just require an intern to pass a criminal history record check pursuant to Section 846-2.7. So we'll have to amend Section 846-2.7 to effectuate that intent. Uh, we will uh, add some language uh, to make it clear uh, that the workers' compensation coverage uh, lapses on the earlier of either the last day of February following the graduating year or the date the internship ends. So we will add some language to make sure that that's clear. Oh, and, and technical amendments as well. Those are my recommendations. <clears throat> Members, any questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2286, SD2, HD2. Um, any members voting with reservations or no? Recommendations adopted. Thank you. Next, moving on to uh, Senate Bill 2291, Senate Draft 2, House Draft 1. Um, I would like to include uh, on uh, some amendments. So I, I propose some amendments on page 2, line 1. Rather than naming the Hawaii Farm Bureau, which is really not, which is really frowned upon by naming a nonprofit organization in statute. Rather than naming the Hawaii Farm Bureau in statute, uh, I would like to describe the organization. For example, it would be you know, a representative of a nonprofit organization founded by Hawaii's farmers and ranchers that works with organizations, communities, and individuals involved in the agricultural industry in Hawaii or the representative's designee who shall be invited by the governor to participate. So that way it's clear they, they're, that's who we're looking for. Uh, and then, I will, uh, and that's it. Uh, and technical amendments, just to be on the safe side. It already has a defective date, so that's my recommendation. Uh, members, questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2291 SD2 HD2. Any members with reservations or no? Recommendations adopted. Thank you. Next, Senate Bill. 2615, Senate Draft 1, House Draft 1, relating to county labor standards. 
I would like to incorporate the uh, recommended amendment from the General Contractors Association of Hawaii. Uh, and I got prior concurrence on that. Um, I did not get prior concurrence on the change recommended uh, by uh, the um, Regional Council of Carpenters. So uh, regarding changing the word uh, in here um, to be contractors only. So I think I, I would encourage them to speak with uh, the labor chair to get that cleared. And if it is clear, to bring that up uh, in finance committee, which gets this bill next. So my recommended change is only the amendment as recommended in the General Contractors Association of Hawaii testimony. Members, questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2615 SD2 HD2. Any members with reservations or no? Seeing none, your recommendations adopted. Thank you. Senate Bill 2562, Senate Draft 3. Uh, I Just to be uh, consistent, uh, what I'd like to do is insert the language in here, the bill that we passed out of this committee in the past, House Bill 1527, House Draft 1, with additional technical amendments. And I want to, uh, that, that includes a defective date uh, of year 3000. And we'll take this uh, negotiate a final version in conference. So again, this is uh, with amendments, inserting the language of House Bill 1527HD1 with technical amendments. Members, questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2562SD3HD1. Any members with reservations or voting no? Recommendations adopted. Thank you. Senate Bill 3236. I'd like to defect the effective date to the year 3000 and uh, move this on to finance and encourage uh, all the expert attorneys on finance to ask the hard questions of uh, DHHL to make sure that we got this right. So it'll be amended just with the defective effective date. Members, questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 3236 with amendments. Any reservations or no's? Recommendations adopted. Thank you. Next bill, Senate Bill 2289, SD2HD1, relating to Kalapapa. On this, uh, I would like to incorporate the recommended amendments uh, from uh, Mr. Vanderbilt uh, from his testimony. And I received prior concurrence from the Chair of Water and Land Committee for that. And uh, I would also uh, like uh, to delete the language on page 3, lines 11 through 16, to remove the sunset language. Uh, but we will keep the defective date of July 1, 3000. And all of these recommended amendments have been cleared with Water and Land Chair. Members, questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2289, SD2, HD2. Any members with reservations or voting no? Recommendations adopted. Thank you. Next measure, Senate Bill 2512, SD2, HD1. On this, uh, I would like to um, move this out with uh, technical amendments and on uh, page 4, line 1 through 17, I want to uh, clarify some of this language here because uh, this language refers to transfer of funds, but the paragraph deals with expenditures or use of contributions or grants and money, not necessarily the transfer of funds from program I IDs. So I just need to do some revising of the terminology in there to make it clearer. So I'll do technical amendments plus uh, that clarifying language. Members, questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2512, SD2, HD2. Any members with reservations or no? No, uh, 
Recommendations adopted. Thank you. <coughs> Senate Bill 3305, HD1, relating to education. Uh, I recommend that we make some technical amendments only. Members, questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 3305, HD2. Any members with reservations or no's? Recommendations adopted. Thank you. Senate Bill 3242, SD1, HD1. I'd like to move this out as is. Already has a defective date. Questions or concerns, members? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 3242, SD2, HD1, passing as is. Any members with reservations or no's? Recommendations adopted. Thank you. On this next bill, uh, I want to be really cautious about moving forward with these uh, automated speed enforcement uh, systems program. In the last committee, this was significantly broadened in scope. Uh, so now the current bill has school, one school or work zone in each county. Um, and uh, I would, I'd, I'd like to uh, narrow the program both in terms of uh, trying to get our necessary experience in a pilot program, also reducing the cost uh, and um, giving the public a chance to adapt to it. So I'd like to narrow the program so it's only in the places where the, the current red light uh, camera program exists, rather than have it spread out in school zones and work zones in different counties. So it's only going to be where the red light program currently exists, the red light camera program currently exists. I did clear this with the transportation chair. Um, I would like to, uh, with that in mind, it, it's going to modify the bill. If there's, uh, the, when the Attorney General's amendments uh, were recommended in their uh, testimony, if any of them are still relevant after that change, we can adopt them. Uh, and um, I also want to, uh, going to have to do some revisions in the bill because the measure alternates when referencing the new chapter, Section 291C and Section 291C-102, making it difficult to understand how these two sections interact with each other in the new chapter. I must be a simple guy because I was getting confused. So I, for consistency and clarity, I, I want to make amendments to clarify the references and language. And uh, this would include when referring to violations subject to the automated speed enforcement system, I'll reference both sections 291C-102 and 291C blank as applicable and make it clear that the violation is for exceeding the maximum speed limit. Oh, oh it's so good I've got staff that keeps track. Okay, what, okay, when, so I, I'm going to adopt the AG amendments, but uh, so that when referring to violations subject to the automated speed enforcement system, I'll reference 291C blank instead of section 291C-102 as recommended by the AG, and make it clear that the violation is for exceeding the maximum speed limit, not the minimum speed limit. Okay, so that's, that's the first one. The next one is when referring to the collection of fines, I want to refer to both the new chapter and section 291C, dash blank. And then on page 12, line 20, to page 13, line 3, the language should read, quote, in the event a registered owner is cited pursuant to this chapter, to chapter blank, and the driver of the motor vehicle is also cited by a police officer pursuant to this part for the same incident, the citation issued pursuant to chapter blank shall be dismissed. And then we'll make technical amendments needed for clarity, consistency, and style. Okay, those are my recommended changes. Members, questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair for the vote. Voting on Senate Bill 2443, SD2, HD2. Any members with reservations? Or, or Rep uh, Representative Gannadin has reservations. Any other members with reservations or no's? Recommendations adopted. Hey, thank you very much. There being no fur further business before this committee, we are adjourned. <laughs>